Hi, Bookish Besties. My name is Brittany. This is Rescues and Reads. Thank you so much for joining me here today. If you are new, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And if you are already subscribed, as always, I appreciate your continued support. Thank you for returning to another video. It is time to do my June reading roundup. I cannot believe it is already time to do another reading roundup and this one is going to be a doozy y'all because I'm also going to be using this video as kind of a wrap up for the amazing readathon. It is actually June 30th when I'm filming this so the readathon is not 100% over yet but it's about to be and in an effort to get this video up as timely as possible I wanted to go ahead and film this today when I could. If you are new to my reading roundups it's basically in replacement of a formal wrap up because I hate sitting here and trying to remember all the details of the books that I read throughout the month. It's very time consuming. It's very laborious. And so instead I created this new video series which encompasses a few things. I will run through all of the books that I've read for the month. I will also try to talk about some tops and bottoms if I have any. There will also be some bookish stats, my haul and unhaul, and at the very end of the video we will balance the books to see if my physical TBR is going in the right direction. So as I mentioned this is going to be a little bit on the longer side I think just because I do want to take an opportunity to wrap up The Amazing Readathon, my experiences, the books that I read, and all of that good stuff. If you are not familiar The Amazing Readathon was created by Brie over at Four Paws in a Book. It is a competitive team-based readathon that is based around the amazing race and it is a very complicated detailed super fun and chaotic readathon and I was honored that Brie allowed me to be a moderator for the discord. I chose Team Spooky to be a part of because mystery thriller horror those are all of my main genres and so I just had a blast being a part of the amazing readathon answering questions getting to know all of my stabby ghosts in Team Spooky and just being involved in this wonderful community that Brianna helped create and because of the amazing readathon I definitely had my best month yet in terms of quantity of books for sure. So so our very first destination for the amazing readathon was Toronto, Ontario, Canada, and for that we had to read a book that we didn't buy. So for this I actually read Evocation by S.T. Gibson because while I did have the physical book, I actually decided to listen to it via audio, which I got from my library. So that was my very, very first experience with S.T. Gibson. I know that she has become a very, very popular author. A Dowry of Blood seems to be a lot of booktubers' very favorite book. I haven't read it yet. I haven't decided whether I'm going to give it an opportunity. I enjoyed Evocation for the most part, but it took me a little while to get into. I found myself confused throughout part of the book, but I did like the relationship dynamics in there. S.T. Gibson really made me care about the characters and their relationships, so I could be persuaded to read more from her in the future. Then after I arrived in Toronto, I decided to do some sightseeing, and the very first book I decided to read was The Return of Ellie Black by Amiko Jean, which satisfied a 500-point sightseeing prompt to read a book with a person's name in the title. This is a new mystery thriller release by Amiko Jean, and overall I remember having a really good time reading it. I did end up giving it a four stars, but I'm going to be completely honest and say that at this point, I don't remember too terribly many of the details of the book, but I do know that I had a really good time reading it. I would absolutely be willing to read more from Amigo Jean in the future, and so this was my very first sightseeing stop. Then it was time to go on to our next destination, which was Buenos Aires, Argentina, and that was to read a book with two POVs, no more, no less. I had a tough time with this, honestly, because it seemed like all of the books that were on my TBR were either one POV or multiple POVs, or like I would start a book and it seemed like it was going to be two POVs and then they would throw in more. So I ended up reading based on recommendations I got in Team Spooky. They Never Learned by Lane Fargo, which was a book that was already on my TBR, and not only that, but it satisfied another reading challenge prompt that I was doing for the year. This is the ultimate story of female revenge, female rage. So if you are looking for a really good revenge story, I highly recommend this one. I definitely did have a really excellent time with this, and I gave it four stars as well. And then, of course, it was time to sightsee again, and so next I picked up My Sister the Serial Killer by Oyinkin Braithwaite. Now this satisfied another 500 level sightseeing prompt of reading a book with exactly five words in the title, and if you all remember my TBR, this is is actually one that I pulled out of my TBR challenge cup because it did satisfy some other reading challenge prompts that I'm doing throughout the year. I actually had a really good time with this one. I enjoyed it more than I thought that I would. I did end up giving it a three star just because it was so short so quick. You don't really get an opportunity to truly connect with the characters or anything like that but I did really overall have a decent time with it. And then next I was able to satisfy yet another 500 level sightseeing prompt and that was to read a book with all five vowels on the cover. For that I read The Invisible Husband of Frick Island by Colleen Oakley which was another book that was already on my TBR for the month of June and Sadly, this was the lowest rated book for the month at a 2.5 stars. And I was actually really surprised by that because I expected to love this. I have really enjoyed the other two Colleen Oakleys that I've read in the past. So I went into this with very high expectations. I'm going to do a brief review of this so you'll kind of understand a little bit about why I disliked it. But know that there's going to be a spoilers attached to this because I don't feel like I can really explain why I disliked it without giving spoilers. So this follows our main character, Piper Parrish. She lives on a small island in the Chesapeake Bay, kind of like one of those places where everyone knows absolutely everyone, you know what I mean? And she actually recently lost 
lost her husband, Tom. They were only married for a short time, but they had been together for many, many years. And she's kind of lost. She doesn't know what to do. She's very deep in her grief. And suddenly she starts to pretend like Tom is still there. She fully believes that Tom is there with her. And everybody on the island goes along with it because they don't want to upset Piper. And then one day a journalist arrives on the island. He arrives there for a completely different reason, but then he uncovers Piper's story. And he decides that he wants to get to the bottom of Piper's story. Like he wants to cover Piper. He thinks that Piper is the ultimate news story on Frick Island. But of course, the longer that he's on Frick Island and he starts getting to know the people and Piper, he loves the island, he loves the people. And of course he starts to fall in love with Piper. So first I would say that my main disappointment in this story is that it was not nearly as deep as I thought it was going to be. When you're reading the synopsis of this, you think that you're going to get a deep exploration into grief. You obviously have a woman who is deeply, deeply grieving the loss of her husband so suddenly, so unexpectedly. And she's grieving him so much so that she's now pretending that he is still alive on this island. So when you hear that a journalist is going to the island and he's going to start covering her story and then start getting to know her, I really felt like this was going to be a very emotional, deep exploration of grief. And then it was also going to be a beautiful love story and a beautiful second chance love for Piper. But that's not what you get. Overall, I feel like everything was very surface level, very superficial. I don't really feel like Colleen Oakley dove deeply at all into grief. I didn't feel like this was an emotional experience. And I also really didn't even like the reporter in the story. I think his name was Anders. He was just very, I don't know, young. Both he and Piper were young, by the way. They were in their early 20s. And that was also something that I was not expecting going into this. I was expecting them to be a little bit more mature. So ultimately, the reporter definitely felt young, very inexperienced, really didn't know what he was doing or the consequences of what he was doing. And so I really just didn't care about him. And I didn't really care about his relationship with Piper. And here's where the spoiler comes about. You find out that Piper has been faking it the whole time. Yes, she has been faking having her husband there with her. There was a time early on in her grief when she kind of woke up and she did believe that maybe he was there with her, but she got over it really quickly. But because all of the people on the island were going with her on this, she didn't really want to disappoint them. I'm still not even entirely sure on her reasoning because it made absolutely no sense to me, but she went along with it this whole time, even though she knew that she was faking. And I just really felt like that undermined the whole entire point of the story. But not only that, I felt like it was a slap in the face to those who are grieving and who might actually experience this phenomenon because it's a real thing. And so I felt like this was just very insensitive to that. Even though I would say that my reading experience throughout was okay, I wasn't hating my reading experience of it. It was not even close to what I wanted for this story. So this was clearly the most disappointing book that I read for the month of June. And then I was also able to get one more sightseeing book in before the next city prompt dropped. This was to read a book with one person on the cover. And for that, I read Girls Like Us by Christina Alger. This I was also able to use to satisfy a buzzword for the buzzword reading challenge hosted by Kayla from Books and Lala. I really enjoyed another book that I read by Christina Alger called The Banker's Wife. And ultimately, this is just a forgettable one for me. Like I know when I was reading it, it was an okay time, but it's one of those things that you read it, it's done, it's over with, and you never think about again. And I can hardly remember absolutely any details about this story whatsoever. So I gave it a three stars. I think I will go ahead and hold on to this just because I do still have The Banker's Wife, but it was definitely not a memorable reading experience. All right, and then it was off to our next destination, which for this time was Berlin, Germany. And the prompt was to read a book with movement in the title, or at the very least, if you could complete a sentence with I can this, that would count. And so for this, I actually selected The Wishing Game by Meg Schaefer because this was already on my TBR for the month of June. It was one of y'all's recommendations and I actually really enjoyed it. I had a good time with it. I gave it a four stars. It was very sweet, heartwarming, charming. I didn't really go into it with very many expectations, but overall I found it to be very heartwarming and very sweet and I couldn't really ask for much more than that. So I gave that a four stars. And then I don't believe I was able to sightsee in between Berlin and our next travel destination, which was Paris, France. And the prompt for this one was to read a book that has won an award of some kind. And for that, I selected If I Die Tonight by Alison Galen. I can't remember offhand what the award it won was, but I read it. It was a good time. I gave it a 3.5. I've really enjoyed everything that I've read by Alison Galen in the past. This is another one that wasn't super memorable, but overall I did have a good time with it. And I do think it left a little bit of a lasting impression. So again, a 3.5. Then it was time for some more sightseeing and I was able to satisfy the prompt of reading a book with a plane, train, or car on the cover by reading Falling by TJ Newman. This was just an edge of your seat, fast paced thriller set on a plane that has basically been hijacked and you're following a bunch of different characters and the decisions that they're making and how they're trying to survive the situation. I had a really good time with this. I will say that my experience with this is the same as many of my other experiences with books that are very plot based, very fast paced, not so character driven. And that at the end of the day, I don't know how much of it I'm going to remember, but I did give this a four star for an overall solid reading experience. Stephen Weber narrates the audiobook, and that was just such a pleasant surprise because I only know Stephen Weber as an actor. I was very much a fan of him when he was on Wings, the comedy series back in the early 90s. And I didn't even know he was an audiobook narrator. So to hear him do this book was just such a treat and he did it very, very well. So, so I will absolutely be willing to read more from him in the future. All right, then it was time to go off to our next destination and that was Cape Town, South Africa. And the prompt for this was to read a book with nature on the cover. And I was happy to be 
able to satisfy this with Middle Tide by Sarah Crouch. Now I gave this a 3.5 stars but I will say that I had a really enjoyable reading experience of this. However I will say that this is very much mismarketed. It's very much touted as a thriller, mystery, etc. And there is a mystery element to this. I will say it's not a thriller suspense at all. Don't go into this thinking that it's going to be a thriller suspense. This definitely is a mystery but I feel like the mystery is a backdrop because it's primarily following our main character Elijah and his life and his relationships with two very distinct women in this story. So ultimately if this had been set in present day I would say that it was contemporary. As it is it's set in like I would say the early 90s for the most part. So overall I would say is basically just historical fiction. It's kind of just based on the life of this Elijah person and what he's going through with these women and then when one of them ends up dead he becomes the main suspect. But the forefront of the story is him and his life and his decisions and all of that. And I know a lot of people went into this with very different expectations and so when they read it they were disappointed. So I'm just giving you the proper expectations going into this. Like I said I personally had a really good time just because I am a character driven reader. So I wasn't mad about this. Will it leave a lasting impression? I don't know but that's why I kind of settled on like a 3.5 instead of a 3 or a 4. Then I was able to sightsee some more and I satisfied the prompt of reading a book that has over a 4.0 on Goodreads with the housemaid is watching. This was not originally on my TBR for the month of June. It was not on my radar for June at all but it was so so kindly sent to me by Jarrett my lovely subscriber and friend who is constantly causing chaos on my sprints. Thank you so much to Jarrett for sending this to me. I had a great time with this. I actually think that I enjoyed this the most. It might be my favorite. It's definitely better than the second book. I don't know if it beat the first book but I absolutely really loved this. This follows Millie several years after the ending of the second book and some sinister things are going down in the neighborhood in which she resides and I just really enjoyed seeing the conclusion to the story so I would definitely consider this a top for the month overall. I gave it a solid four stars and I'm very very glad that I was able to read this. Another sightseeing prompt I was able to satisfy was to read a book with over 100,000 ratings on Goodreads and for that I selected Meet Me at the Lake by Carly Fortune. This is another one that was not on my radar to read at all. However because I DNF'd Exiles by Jane Harper which was originally on my TBR for June to satisfy a reading challenge prompt of reading a book by an Australian, New Zealand or Canadian author. I had to go ahead and find something else to satisfy that prompt. Carly Fortune is from Canada so it satisfied that and it was also able to fulfill a sightseeing prompt. Now I will say that I had a lot of technical issues with this. It was definitely not nearly as strong as every summer after. However even though I had all of those technical issues with it I still had a great time with this. I still really liked the relationship between our two main characters and even when I was like filling in my spreadsheet like getting ready to film this video and I picked this book up I had a smile on my face about it because I just enjoyed it so much. So I did settle on a solid four star for this and I will absolutely be reading more from Carly Fortune in the future. I just think that she has a wonderful way of writing characters. I feel like with her stories you're able to really deeply get to know the characters and I just love that. So thankfully this satisfied a TBR challenge prompt and a sightseeing prompt for The Amazing Readathon. All right and then it was finally time for our next destination which was Antan Nanarivo, Madagascar and for that was to read a prompt that featured gods or religion in some way and for that I picked up My Darkest Prayer by S.A. Cosby. This was the final book by S.A. Cosby that I needed to read in order to have read all of his backlist and I loved this. This is definitely my second favorite, second only to Razorblade Tears. This definitely showcased S.A. Cosby's darkness and grittiness. I mean all of his books do but I felt this really had similar vibes to Razorblade Tears and so I think I'm gonna go ahead and settle on a four stars but definitely during my time reading it and when I was done with it it was like a solid 4.5. I had a great time with this. I love S.A. Cosby. I love his writing. His writing is beautiful for the very dark subject matter that he creates and I just love his characters. I will read anything that this man writes going forward. This is 100% a top read for the month for sure. I didn't get any sightseeing done for that round so next it was off to Seoul, South Korea and for that I needed to read a book with a source of light on the cover and that actually prompted me to finally get to A Quiet Life by Ethan Joella. You can see that there's a little candle burning here. I went through every single book on my physical TBR trying to find something and I didn't think I was going to be able to. I thought I was going to have to go to like my virtual TBR to see if I could find something but this was literally the last book I checked and it worked. I'm very glad to have gotten to this one just because this is one that I've considered unhauling for quite a while. I was really hesitant about picking it up. There was just something about it that wasn't pulling me in and so I wanted to go ahead and pick it up and ultimately I had a really positive reading experience with this. It follows three characters who are dealing with grief in three very very different circumstances and what happens when they all kind of find each other and come together. It was very sweet, very heartwarming, very touching. I enjoyed all of the characters. There was never a time when I didn't want to be reading it but ultimately I think I'm only going to settle on like a 3, 3.5 for this one because again I don't necessarily know if it has lasting capacity. It was very very short so it didn't necessarily make a super lasting impression on me. I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to hang on to this or unhaul this one but I am glad to finally have it off of my TBR. Then it was time for more sightseeing and I was able to satisfy the sightseeing prompt of reading a book with only text on the cover and for that I read X by Sue Grafton. This is the second to last book in her Alphabet Murder series so I only have one book left to go before I am done and I am so grateful to say that I loved this. This was a solid four stars and it was definitely a top for the month. In some ways it was a bit darker than her other stories because it does deal with a serial killer who gets away and my understanding is you deal more with that serial killer in 
die. And so I'm very excited to see if there's a conclusion to that story and to see if that story actually does have an ending. Just because why is the end of the alphabet in this case? Because Sue Grafton did pass away and obviously is not continuing the series. So I'm so grateful that I enjoyed my reading experience of this one. Obviously I've been reading the series for so terribly long that I don't remember all of the other books at all, especially since they kind of like run together. But I was so grateful to be back with Kinsey in this world with these characters, such a solid plot that Sue Grafton created in this one. And I was very happy to read this. The only book that I completed in the month of June that was not for the amazing readathon was A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass. I don't have the dust jacket on here because I have a new one that I need to put on here, but I finally finished it. I started it in May. My reading experience of this was very hindered by other things going on in my life. And honestly, for a lot of this, I just kind of wanted it to be done. This is definitely not my favorite Sarah J. Mass book. I will say that the last maybe 100 or so pages of it pushed this to a four star, but for the most part, it was like a three, 3.5 star. I just wanted it to be done. It was entirely too long. I could tell that Sarah J. Mass just wrote this to give Nesta a redemption arc, and I didn't feel like it needed to be a 751 page book. Ultimately, for like the first 500 or so pages of this book, it was literally just Nesta being awful and her and Castian having sex. There was plenty in this book that could have been cut out. I am glad that Nesta got her redemption arc, and ultimately now I can abide her as a character and I can see her with Cassian. So I do feel like Sarah J. Mass was able to achieve her purpose in that regard. There was just something about this that really didn't work for me, but I ultimately did settle on a four stars and it's done and it's over with. All right, next we were off to Bangkok, Thailand. And for this, I needed to read a book with at least five colors on the title. And so I went ahead and cheated a little bit and pulled from my July TBR, which I had already filmed by that point. And I picked up The Orphan's Tale by Pam Genoff because this was on my July TBR. Not only did it fit the prompt, but it was something that I owned. So it would physically get off my TBR. And also it was something that was immediately available to me from my library. And that was important to me. So I went ahead and picked this up. I had a good time with this. I think it was a solid historical fiction and I gave it a four stars. And the next we were off to Auckland, New Zealand. And for that, I needed to read a book with water on the cover. And I was very thankful to finally be able to get to One Perfect Couple by Ruth Ware, which I just finished the other day. I had a great time with this. Solid four stars. Highly recommend. All right. Now, One Perfect Couple is technically the final book that I completed in the month of June. I'm currently reading a book for the 10th and final leg of the Amazing Readathon. Our destination for that was Los Angeles. And that was to read a book that you would like to see adapted into a movie. So for this, I originally selected Badlands by Stacey Marie Brown. That is another book that is on my July TBR. It is the fourth book in the Savage Land series. And I started listening to it and I realized that I'm going to DNF the series. The reason is, is because this is one of those series that it jumps right into the next book from where the last one left off. And so if there's like any time in between when you're reading the books, you're kind of left floundering, trying to figure out what was going on. And I realized as soon as I started book four, I remembered absolutely nothing about what happened in book three. And I couldn't be bothered to go check. I had tried to find spoiler filled summaries of the book and I couldn't find any. And I didn't really want my brain to have to work so hard to try to figure out what was going on. And I just didn't care. I really honestly just didn't care. I had a really good time with the first three books and I might have had a great time with the second three books in the series, but ultimately I decided to just go ahead and DNF it. So I will probably be unhauling the first three books in that series. And obviously I won't be reading it for July or this prompt. So I went ahead instead and picked up The Nature of Fragile Things by Susan Meisner. Susan Meisner is a historical fiction author that I have really, really enjoyed in the past. I'm not going to be finishing this today, but Brie has said that if we get to the 50% mark, we can count those pages for the readathon. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be getting to 50% today, maybe even past that and then finish it tomorrow. So this will technically be a July book. But since I'm reading most of it today in June, I wanted to go ahead and just discuss it here. This will be part of the bookish stats that I'm talking about, everything but the rating and the page number, which I'm not going to put down for these stats. So I'm about 30% of the way into it now. And this is set in 1906. And it follows a woman who is essentially kind of a mail order bride. She's trying to get out of her current situation. And she marries a man who is looking for a new mother for his daughter. And ultimately she finds out that her husband is kind of a con man and he's married to another woman. And we're just kind of finding that out and getting into the mystery. So I'm really interested to see where it goes. I've really enjoyed Susan Meisner in the past and I'm excited to dive more into this one and get to the 50% mark. But I did want to mention it here since I'm reading most of it today. And also I did mention this briefly earlier, but I did DNF Exiles by Jane Harper. I mentioned this in my TBR video, but I was never impressed with the other two books in that series or the other standalone that I read by Jane Harper. I wanted to go ahead and read Exiles just to kind of finish out the series since there was only one book left. It only took a couple of chapters getting into that book to realize it wasn't for me. It wasn't what I wanted to read. So I'm going to be unhauling that as well as the other two books in the Aaron Falk series. And that's it y'all. I know that was a little bit longer than normal just because I wanted to wrap up the Amazing Readathon, but I had a blast with the Amazing Readathon. If you couldn't tell, it was such a wonderful reading month. I had a great time with the entire community and I'm very grateful to have been able to take part in it. All right, now let me go ahead and quickly run through the bookish stats for the month of June. So for the month of June, I completed 19 books and that was 6,147 pages. Again, that's not going to include the nature of fragile things, which I'm still in the middle of. Out of the ratings, I gave one 2.5 stars, three, three stars, three, 3.5 stars and 11, four star ratings. So that's not bad. And my average rating for the month was a 3.7. Again, these ratings are not going to include the nature of fragile things, which I'm still 
novel reading. In terms of genres, I classified four as contemporary, two as crime fiction, two as pure fantasy, two as historical fiction, two as mystery, and seven as thriller, which makes sense since I was trying to prioritize reading only within the thriller mystery horror genre for The Amazing Readathon. And of course, in terms of formatting, all 19 were novels. We all know by now that I really don't read novellas, comics, graphic novels, etc. And out of the 19 books that I read, 18 of them were fully listened to via audio, and one of them was immersively read, and that was A Court of Silver Flames by Sarah J. Mass. In terms of where I sourced the audiobooks from, five of them were sourced from Audible, two of them were sourced from Everand, 11 of them were sourced from my library, and one of them was sourced from Spotify. In terms of audience, 18 of them were purely meant for an adult audience, and then I put Silver Flames under new adult audience. With regard to author and publication, eight of the authors that I read for the month of June were new to me, and this also can include debut authors, and then 11 of them were authors that I've read from before. In terms of publication year, I definitely had a wide variety of publication years. I had two from 2023, three from 2021, one from 2017, one from 2019, five from 2024, one from 2015, two from 2022, one from 2020, and two from 2018. All right, so that does it for the wrap-up and the bookish stats. Now it's time to get into the haul and the unhaul, but of course, before we do, we have to establish a baseline to figure out where my TBR numbers were at the end of May. At the end of May, I calculated that I had 40 books on my physical TBR. Out of all the books that I finished or DNF'd in the month of June, 13 of those were actually from my physical TBR, meaning we brought my physical TBR down to 27 during the month of June. So now we are quickly going to run through the books that I've hauled and unhauled for the month of June. So the very first book that I hauled was actually sent to me by the publisher, and that was Shelterwood by Lisa Wingate. So I've mentioned this before, but I moderate a book club over on Goodreads reads called the Bookworm Bitches book club and the publisher reached out to me to see if our book club might be interested in reading Shelterwood and I had to explain to them that the books we read are based on polls like we don't actually just decide on one book people make nominations and then there's a poll and they vote etc so I really have no control over whether or not we would read the book but if they wanted to send it to me I would be happy to read it and provide a review because I've enjoyed Lisa Wingate in the past so they very kindly sent this to me I'm really looking forward to it I don't know too terribly much about it it says it's a sweeping novel inspired by the untold history of women pioneers who fought to protect children caught in the storm of land barons hungry for power and oil wealth. So this would be my second book by Lisa Wingate. I'm absolutely willing to trust her with this one and I hope to get to it soon. Then moving on into my book of the month selections for the month of June. Of course we have One Perfect Couple by Ruth Ware. As I mentioned I have already read this. I really enjoyed it and I gave it a four stars. I also selected Not in Love by Allie Hazelwood. I'm a little bit trepidatious about this one because from what I understand this is an erotic romance. It's going to be different than what she's written with regard to her Steminist novels and so that's really not my thing but I have it and I have to at least give it a try because I have vowed I have to give every book that comes into my home going forward at least a chance. So I am going to give it a chance. If I don't enjoy it, I think that's going to be the end of my relationship with Allie Hazelwood. And then I also picked up A Talent for Murder by Peter Swanson. I've only ever read one book by Peter Swanson. It was many, 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 many years ago and I've always wanted to give him another chance. So when I saw this on Book of the Month, I decided to go ahead and jump on the opportunity. From what I understand, this follows a woman who believes her husband is a serial killer and I'm all about that. So this is another one that I plan to get to as soon as possible. I also hold Meet Me at the Lake in June. As soon as I read it, I went ahead and purchased it on Pango. Again, as I mentioned, I really enjoyed my time with this one and I gave it a four stars. And again, this is another one that I hauled in June. It was a gift from Jarrett. So thank you so much, Jarrett. And again, I've already read it, so it's not being added to my TBR. And then the very last book that I have to haul for the month of June is actually the May Fairy Loot book that didn't come to me until June. And that is The Honey Witch by Sydney J. Shields. This is definitely one that I am interested in and it's actually already been added to my July TBR. This definitely sounds like it's going to be magical realism because it's going to be set in our world, but there are witches. So there's a magical aspect to it. This edition is absolutely stunning. I'm very excited to read it. It's already on hold at my library and I will be getting to it as soon as possible. All right, so if my math is correct, out of all the books that I've hauled for the month of June, only four of them remain unread. So that will bring my physical TBR from 27 to 31. And now let's go ahead and get into the unhauls. So as I mentioned, I'm unhauling Exiles and I'm probably going to be unhauling the other two books in the Aaron Falk series as well. I've already incorporated this into the TBR number, so I'm not going to do so again, but this one is going to be taken off of my shelves. I'm also going to be unhauling the first three books in the Savage Land series by Stacey Marie Brown just because if I'm not going to be finishing that series I'm not going to be keeping those on my shelves but again those weren't already on my TBR so those aren't counting towards my TBR numbers. Now these next two books I don't think I'm going to be unhauling them but I'm going to be removing them from my active TBR. So first I have the Beautiful Seasons edition of And of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery. I also have the Beautiful Seasons edition of Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. So here's the thing I am not a classics reader. I don't really enjoy classics for the most part. I tend to read maybe once a year and that takes a lot of mental brain power for me. I have to be in a place where I know that I can concentrate on a classic. I typically immersion read them just to make it a little bit easier. They're not really something that I actively seek out or want to read but there are definitely notable classics that I really do want to read but I do not like having these on my active TBR because
because it's pressuring me to read them when I might not be ready to read them for years. Who the heck knows when the next time I'm going to pick up a classic. Now one of the reasons why I wanted to go ahead and unhaul these two, I also have Wuthering Heights on my active TBR. It's in a different edition. It's in the Chiltern edition. It's because the Chiltern editions are the ones that I prioritize collecting. I really absolutely do love all the season's editions and I have a handful of them on my shelves as well, which is why I don't think I want to unhaul these ones outright because I don't think I would unhaul the other ones that I've already read. But since the Chiltern books are the ones that I'm actively prioritizing collecting, I'm okay keeping Wuthering Heights on my TBR and that is the one that I will be reading next when I do feel like it's time for me to read a classic. So for right now, I think these are just going to go on my shelves with the other editions, but they are going to be removed from my active TBR because I don't know if or when I will ever read them. All right, that is it. That is the haul. That is the unhaul. And if my math is correct, that would bring me down to roughly about 29 bucks on my physical TBR, which I'm absolutely ecstatic about. I don't anticipate my TBR getting to zero by the end of the year, but it's definitely going to get to a point where I no longer feel like I need to do a balancing of the books, which is pretty exciting if I do say so myself. All right, everybody, this has definitely been a long one. If you participated in the amazing readathon, please comment down below and let me know how your reading went, or you can just let me know some of the best or worst books that you read for the month. I would love to know that as well. If you have made it to the end of this video and you are not feeling chatty, but want to let me know that you were here, go ahead and just leave me a world emoji in honor of traveling for the amazing readathon. And as always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week, one on Wednesdays, one on Sundays, and I would love to connect with you in any of those future videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below, along with any books that I might talk about in a video. Until next time, y'all. Bye.